This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. Hello, uh, Jacka. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Melbourne Veteran Seminars. This is Panos Lukopoulos, and I would like to warmly welcome our speaker today, Dr. Rick Benny, aka the Red Dog Vet, who is joining us from Western Australia. Uh, before we start, we would like to acknowledge the Woi Wurrung and Banaran peoples, the traditional owners of the land on which we live, work, and study. We recognize the unique place they hold as the original custodians of the lands and waterways across the Australian continent and acknowledge their enduring cultural practices of caring for country. For those, for those of us that may not know Rick, his career is quite different from most of ours. He's been a vet in rural WA for over 50 years and also has a very strong media profile. He's extremely well known, at least in WA, uh, as a real life vet to Red Dog the famous Kelpie that roamed the Pilbara in the 70s. He's also branched out to becoming a, an entrepreneur using the veteran facilities he set up to establish a broader business group. He's published the Red Dog Vet Books. He starred in the TV series Desert Vet recently. Uh, his business group includes 15 vet practices, uh, mainly in uh, Western Australia, and I think one or two in South Australia and a couple in Wales, I believe. Yes, and and um, th yeah, this is branded as the Pets and Vets Group. Uh, he also owns a retreat resort and other businesses and has appeared on the ABC and, and other media. Uh, so we've invited Rick to share some of his fascinating experiences in his 50-year veteran journey and to share some of the lessons he's learned. So Rick, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Your presentation is definitely one of the, of the highlights uh, of the series to date. And I would like to, I guess we'll do this uh, a little bit differently than most seminars we hold uh, where we have a PowerPoint uh, followed by questions, uh, something like more of an interview style, I guess, if you don't mind. Uh, so I guess I would like to start by asking you why you chose to do the vet course in the first place, and if in hindsight you think it was a wise choice. Yeah, well, it was all a bit of an accident, actually. Uh, I sort of fell into it. Uh, all I remember was that I was. I came from a, a background uh, with a lot of outdoors activity and a lot of animals, and so I was pretty well placed to to get in, into the profession. But it happened when I was uh, just left school and I was working on a wheat bin. I just got my results. Sorry, Rick. Saturday. Rick, uh, yep. can I interrupt? I think that. Do you mind if you share your screen? Perhaps it might be better. Oh, okay. Yeah. Where do we? Ah. Uh, hmm. Where do we do that? I think it should be in the bottom of the screen of your Zoom. I oh, share screen right now. Yep, yep. How's that? I'll oh, share. Not yet, yeah, not yet. Ah, yeah, that's good, yeah. Good. Yep. Okie dokie. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I saw these advertisements for cadetships in the in the state government uh, in ag agricultural science or marine science and veterinary science. So I thought, oh, yeah, they all sound good. They all sound outdoorsy. That sounds a bit like me. So I applied for all three of them. And when I went to the interview these uh, with the Public Service Board, they said, um, hey, son, uh, which one do you really want? Do you want to be an ag scientist, a marine scientist or a vet? And I said, well, I don't know. I'm only 17, and anyway, they start arguing amongst themselves. They had this ding dong fight almost. Eventually, the, the chief veterinary officer thumped the table and just said, 
you guys don't know what you're talking about. Son, just do that. Just just believe me, do that science. The best thing you can ever do. I said, okay. And that was my first interview, my only interview I've ever had, actually. Okay. So, so who was, was this person? Who was was it a, a, a public it, it, servant with the department? Department yeah, it was the chief, chief, chief veterinary officer okay. of Western Australia. Yeah, and so did uh, come with some sort of obligation on your behalf to. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I, I got the cadetship, and which because I couldn't afford, my parents couldn't afford to send me to uni, uh, but the cadetship put me through. But it did, it did come with five years bond afterwards, which was also pretty good, pretty fair, fair enough. They get put me through yeah. five years of university, and I had to work them for five years, and so yeah, it was a pretty, pretty good choice. And it's been um, it been been great a great uh, fifty years ever since. So and when you're saying uh, department, are you are talking about the state department? Is that yeah, the state, state department of agriculture in WA. That's the one, yeah, yeah. So you yeah. had to re return to Western Australia and go to a, I guess a remote area or a regional regional. Oh, I could I could have gone anywhere, um, and again that's where luck comes in. The first bit was my first big strike of luck getting a cadetship, and then the second strike of luck was when I came back, and all the cushy jobs had been taken up, and it left um, two not so cushy jobs, one at Moore and one at um, Derby up in the Kimberley. So mate and I um, tossed a coin, and I got Derby, even though I so I did I did say well, heads heads I go to Derby, tails you go to Moora. And he, and he he he's followed that. So I got to Derby, and that was the the start of my uh, uh, series of good fortune. And the best thing ever happened to me was to go remote, and uh, I've been sort of remote ever ever since. It was uh, it was a very fortuitous decision, and I'll come back to that later when we talk about what new graduates. Yeah, yeah. So did you feel ready to work? I imagine by yourself when you went there. Uh, uh not, not really. I was just straight out of uni, as uh, as we all are at some stage. But it was a very forgiving place, unforgiving yet forgiving. Uh, unforgiving is that it was a, a tough place where you couldn't bullshit and and uh, men were men and all those sort of things. And here, I, here I was a little fresh faced uh, new graduate with um, uh, been at uni for for five or six years, and and there I, there I was working amongst men. But it was forgiving in that. There were no vets around, no other, no other vets, or certainly no private vets. So we had a go at doing everything, and it was the best, the best way to start learning. Because I guess at university you're taught a lot, uh, but you don't start learning until you, until you're out there having a go. So the whole, the, the whole uh, attitude uh, was to have a go, and uh, and you learn by by your mistakes. And there were plenty of mistakes, but. I uh, I've got a theory on that that there's no such thing as a mistake. A mistake is just an opportunity to to improve and and better yourself. And uh, I guess I'm going off script. I guess uh, a little bit, but when you say you were by yourself working as a vet, how close was the closest vet? Uh, uh the the closest private vet was about a thousand miles away in Geraldton or Darwin, uh, but there were. Uh, two or three other government vets in the, in the Kimberley. We we're all government vets. So, like I said, about three or three of us, I think. And we we just had to uh, uh, do the best we could. Yeah. And it was a lot of uh, TB testing, but but also there were every every range of animals you'd ever see. So it was it was uh, it was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I, you you did study at the at the University of Queensland. Yeah. And um, which is where. I happen to have done my postgraduate studies as well, so I'm, I'm very familiar with the place. It's a, it's, a, it's a lovely place, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. Um, I was very, very uh, fortunate to be there for five years. Yeah. So, why you? So, why did you did you choose it, or where did you were you allocated as a cadet to that university? How did yeah. You know? Back in the day, there were only three vet schools in Australia. There was Sydney. Melbourne and uh, Brisbane, uh, but Sydney and Melbourne only took the, the locals. Queensland took uh, everyone, uh, interstate students, overseas students. In fact, they used to take New Zealand students before Massey got started. Uh, and it was, it was a great, great uni to go to. And we had a lot of, had a lot of, um, lot of fun there. Uh, it was good being on a, a very uh, big campus where you know, all other um, things were taught. So you did sort of get to 
to mix with the whole university um, uh, life it was it was good in good in that regard. And um, sort of googling, I guess, you a little bit. Uh, I read that um, I, I was sort of familiar with this that there, if there was some sort of politically slightly uh, different uh, to match a sort of time with uh, with Joe, and that there were um, um, quite a few student protests that you, yeah, I believe, well, it was the it was the um, late sixties, and worldwide there were there was a lot of activism starting to happen. And there was big things happening in Paris and Czechoslovakia and America, of course. And the the Vietnam War was sort of uh, starting to be questioned. So there was a lot of stuff going on. And in 1967 was the famous Great March uh, of September the 8th, where uh, most of the universities there were I think there were 8,000 students at Queensland Uni at that at, at that stage, and about 5,000 of them all marched into the city. Uh, just whatever their political persuasion, because the the issue that we were marching for is the right to march. Because up till then, it was it was in, illegal to hold a hold any gathering uh, unless you had a, um, a a permit from the police. And and of course, the government uh, w- wasn't issuing any. So we thought that was a bit wrong. And there was a uh, one of the uh, f- famous uh, university people, Brian Laver, who activated everyone and. Uh, with some others, Dan O'Neill and Mitch Thompson, and and it was it was we were really unified in the um, in the uh, quest to to march for the for the right to march, right. and that was the start of many. There was a moratorium march a couple of years later, and yeah, it was good to be mixed up in that. But uh, and that was also the benefit of uh, of a wide campus like um, like Queensland. Yeah, well, it wasn't well. Right? That's that is amazing. Yeah. So apart apart from apart from from that, I guess, uh, talking about your your studies, the vet school. Um, uh, I mean, I know it's a good university. I, I, I didn't, I wasn't aware of the fact that there were only three vet schools at the time. But how did you find the the course in itself, the vet course? Um, yeah, it was it was good. It was pretty inclusive, and and it sort of molded you uh, over over those years. Just the 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 ethos, the 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 way thing, things were done. We're we're all that all in all in it together, and you're all learning together. I suppose it's the same today. You you're on a on a mission. I suppose the big difference between then and now is that um, the lecturers were were the enemy, and you know, we we thought they all they wanted to fail us all, um, and and I did fail uh, one year, and it, it took a fair while to sort of to to trust any of them, but. They're all decent people, and some of them were were really good entertainers, and we we liked them. If they were you could give an entertaining lecture, uh, they got top marks from the, from the students. Others were weren't so entertaining, uh, but yeah, it was it was pretty pretty good times. But one of the best things ever happened to me, and I put this down as uh, another piece of luck, uh, was failing second year, and it it was. Probably was looked on as not sort of such a bad thing to do. Uh, they they were always going to fail about twenty percent to get the oh. numbers to what they wanted, and uh, and I think they just culled off whoever got the, the lowest twenty percent in the in the year. But it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I just wasn't uh, emotionally ready for a big move as a I was just a boy and I was only you know nineteen and eighteen nineteen and to go to Queensland from out of Western Australia it was it was like going to another planet really. Uh, so that year that I failed was a bit like a gap year, and I'd always advise anyone to take a gap year because uh, I wasn't ready and I I didn't really understand you know what it was required. But by failing a year, that was the um the kick in the pants that I really needed. And it, I write about a look a lot in book two, which I've I've just written. I haven't published it yet, but uh, book two of Red Dog Vet is all about my Queensland years and and this. Um, this real awakening I had when I failed second year, then had to repeat at my own expense, uh, and there was no money around. I lost my cadetship for the year, mm. and had to work at all sorts of jobs all over all over Brisbane, on um, on the waterfront and uh, and um, and bakery and. So was it while while you were studying? 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, I had because to. you lost, you, you, you failed a year and you lost the cadetship. Yeah, I did. And I had pay, yep, I had to pay interstate fees, which right. were $210 a term. That doesn't sound much like much today, but if you equate it to yeah. the fact that um, the basic wage was a dollar an hour, uh, that was you know, okay. 210 hours of full time work just to pay one term. So to pay for the whole year's fees, I think it was about you know four months of full time work, which I had to do as yeah. well. Um, and actually, when, you're saying, when you're saying 20% of the students failed, uh, how many students were in the year? And uh, did I think you fail about, one subject out of five or something? Or yeah, did you just yeah. fail the whole year? Yeah, did you have to repeat subject. everything? Absolutely. If you fail one subject, you fail, fail the year. And you have to repeat the whole year. And uh, yeah, so I was about, um, there's about another, I think there was, there was, um, 80 odd started the start of the year and um, something like um, you know, 50 or 60 got through and then people were dropping down from that the years ahead as well. So there was quite a high failure rate, certainly in second year and third year. And then it tailed off a bit as um, as we sort of gained confidence and the I guess the lecturers gained confidence in us, but and there was it was it was quite stressful because there was no um, yearly yearly um, um, exams, uh, I'm sorry, you know, no mid-year stuff. It was all at the end of the year. So yeah. it was it was quite stressful and and you know, I wasn't a good student and I, I was probably deserved to fail uh, and I, it, I, I probably struggled to get through. Uh, but I'll, yeah, I'll talk about that a bit later because it was, uh, it was, I was just the wrong sort of person to be an academic or a student, but then I, I guess I spread my wings once I once I got my degree and and uh, started. Yes. And different skills, I, uh, for sure. I, I, I mean, combining different skills. I guess working in these different environments and in different sort of um, yeah, different environments uh, in your gap year, maybe apart from maturing for one year, uh, you were in contact with. Um, uh, what would then become basically your client base, people from all over the place, different backgrounds, maybe it improved your... Well, it did indeed, and I write about this a bit in my, in, my, in my second book, that by working at all these other jobs did did several things. First of all, it gave me the money to get through. Secondly, it did give me, did give me that uh, uh, commonality of working with all sorts of people and all sorts of trades uh, all over the, the, the city. Uh, but it also made me decide I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. I didn't want to be working on the waterfront for the rest of my life, or driving a taxi, or working in a working in a, uh, a bakery. I, yeah. I did decide that, that hey, vet, uh, a vet degree is a pretty pretty good thing to get. So uh, it gave, it taught me resilience uh, and uh, and a lot of other lessons. But um, that was an and determination and single mindedness and all those things and. A lot of those attributes that last me to to this day, but uh, I just had to had to do it, and um, yeah, managed to get through. Yeah, and then yeah, and then uh, came back to WA. And uh, I think you had uh, at least one or two other people in your in your year that uh, branched out uh, to something not strictly veterinary. Is that correct? I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, well, the the classic one, of course, is uh, Graham Turner, or Screw Turner, who uh, started Flight Centre. But before that, he he went to England and he started um, Top Deck Travel, uh, and and he loved it so much he he decided he wouldn't work as a vet anymore. He'd become a uh, a travel person, and and it, that grew into a you know a fabulous business. Yeah. And then he, then he he sold it and about no oh, not in eighty I think, and then came back to Australia and. And but retained flight center, and he's very, very successful. One of our classmates. We had a big re reunion actually last year in, uh, in Queensland, uh, of all our year plus, uh, plus the year that I, I um, was originally in. So I've had two, two reunions at uh, Albert, uh, and we got up to Gatton and, and met everyone. And, and it, was, it was a lovely experience to do all that to see people after you know 50, 50 year reunion, yeah. And uh, but I guess originally all of you wanted to become vets before you branched out. So um, uh, I guess I've, I've read a couple of things about your thoughts on on um, 
uh, I mean, you, you, you basically had a choice of three vet schools, yep. uh, but uh, what about the other way around, about the, um, what was the, let's say, selection criteria apart from, was it just grades or was it, was there a screening process other than purely grades or? Um, back then, I think it, 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 was, it was just uh, grades and probably the same as it is today. And, and that is certainly a bit of a, a, a bugbear for me because I, I see a lot of people who do get into VET who probably should have been screened and, and uh, not done it uh, because they're not very happy there. It's not, it's not for everybody. Uh, but having said that, the, the course is so varied and, you can, and the degree is so varied, you can do all sorts of things for it. But I think uh, I really think what probably should happen as well as a screening, just like the medical schools have a, a pretty strict screening process, so it's not just academic. The other thing is I'd, I'd really love the, um, the schools to have some sort of a, um, a first year where you study the uh, humanities and uh, maybe psychology. Uh, the main thing is to, to get to know yourself, to, to know if you, if you really want to be a vet if you're really suited for it. And it, it took me a couple of years uh, by, by failing and by repeating and, and uh, almost by, the, by that process, I decided, yeah, I was, in the, I was in the right place. But gee, for a lot of people, it must be pretty hard to go, to go straight in and then be expected to pass every year and then get churned out at the end of it and then decide what you're gonna do. So I was, I was certainly pretty lucky that uh, I did persevere and I was able to um, do okay after I'd got my degree, I was able to go out and learn. And I suppose that's one of my, my biggest bits of advice for people is that you, at university, you're, you're taught a lot, but you don't necessarily learn very much. Uh, but the only way you learn is to go out and, and have a go. Uh, and again, I wish I knew more about myself at the time, uh, but I now know more, more that I, what I am like, I am a risk taker. Um, which is probably why I didn't so, do well so well at uni, but I've done okay since. Uh, and it, but it takes all types, and you know nothing. No, nothing's perfect, and no one's perfect. Yeah, and uh, some some things have changed. For example, uh, in in the vet school where this vet school, um, I don't know if you know, it's it's a, it's a it's a postgraduate degree. It's a DVM, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine course. So you have to have something else first. So okay. you're a little bit more, you know, more, I guess, uh, mature, more aware and uh, have some uh, background in um, related fields. So there is some sort of, um, you know, uh, th this is something that has changed. Uh, oh, that's good. Yeah, I'm aware of yeah. that. that well, that's great. That's it. That's what I was alluding to. That's how, how it should be. That yeah, yeah. In states that do something like that. You, you've got to get your college degree before you do your, your, um, your, your uh, graduate degree. Yeah. Um, so I guess I guess you once you graduated, you it was part of your contractual, I guess, obligation or something like that to to go back to or your your cadetship, I guess, obligation yep. to go back to Western Australia. That's and correct. then you did have some limited choice. You were not, let's say, appointed to go to that area or whatever and work as a, as a government vet, but you, um, you had a couple of places to choose from and you stayed there for, in the first place for, did you stay there for the minimum you had to or did yeah, you? Yeah, I had about um, uh, three or four years in, in the Kimberley and then a year in, in the Pilbara uh, and that's when I, I saw the opportunity there. Uh, and as soon as I finished my five years that I was, I was uh, bonded to the government for, I uh, went off and, and started my own practice. But I'd, I'd seen the, the potential of the Pilbara before that by, by driving through there on the way to the Kimberley. And I used to do a lot of, lot of work on the side because, as I was saying before, there were no private vets. So us government vets sort of uh, did whatever we liked. And I used to go down to Port Hedland and I used to use the hospital mortuary to, as my, as my, as my uh, clinic and uh, see clients and do operations and all sorts of things in there. So I, I saw the potential. Uh, so as soon as my, my bond was finished, I, I um, went, uh, went private and 
yeah, that, and sort of just grew, grew it from there. And it's been uh, it's been been growing ever since, and it still is. And and I've uh, enjoyed you know, all of it. And part of what I've been doing is, um, I guess, uh, uh, looking for opportunities and and not staying stuck in one one spot for too long. And not because I love I love a challenge and I love a risk and I love I love uh, opportunities and that's why I've sort of spread all over the place. It may be not for everyone, but it's just sort of worked for me like that. Yeah, yeah. And that's why I've never been never been bored. Yeah, and uh, I have to ask as a, as a pathologist, uh, as a government vet, you must have done quite a few field necropsies. So... Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, well, obviously started off up there doing a lot of lot of cattle and, and horse um, post mortems, and with the the TB testing, we always had to uh, open them up to prove that they a reactor a TB reactor actually had uh, you know, a tuberculosis, and you know, we'd find all the lesions in the lungs and the lymph nodes and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, the same thing with horses. We had a lot of uh, a, a disease called Kimberley horse disease up there at the time. And that's the only original work I've ever done that could be considered uh, a research. We proved, proved Kimberley horse disease was caused by the ingestion of uh, Cratillaria crispata. We did a feeding trial, which would be uh, uh, not allowed these days for ethical reasons, but we, we had uh, four lots of uh, uh, horses that we fed them different, uh, different levels of this poisonous plant. And we waited till they developed the clinical disease. Uh, which they all did, apart from the controls. So yeah, that was a bit of fun. And was it neurological? What sort of? So it's a plant toxicity. Yeah, I've, I've heard the name, but so it's a plant toxicity caused by yeah. some sort of Crotalaria species. Yeah. It's and a, is it neurologic or is it um, what? Yeah, type, what? What are the signs of the? Yeah, it, they 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 get they walk when they have this aimless walk. And it's caused by a uh, it's a an alkaloid in the in the plant, oh. yeah, and that destroy, basically destroys the liver, uh, and and then when there's high levels of of uh, protein circulating in the, in the in the bloodstream when they first start eating, eating green green feed again, they it does affect the, the brain considerably, and they they walk off and die by misadventure usually, but it's uh, yeah, so we we have to open these all these horses up. And uh, take out uh, the brains and livers and things like that. So that was a bit of fun. The other thing I did later on is with heartworm, uh, because uh, heartworm was virtually unknown in Western Australia. It was this, it was considered a disease of um, uh, Queensland and the Northern Territory where there were mosquitoes. But when I was first in in the uh, uh, Cobra area, there was a lot of uh, movement of people from the east to the west for the mining boom. So they'll bring their dogs with them. And they're coming from Queensland and Territory and everywhere. So it was natural that they'd, they'd bring um, uh, dogs with microfilaria in their bloodstream. So it was just a matter of time before heartworm was uh, was established there. A lot of people didn't believe it, but I sort of proved it just by opening up uh, virtually every dog that was uh, that, that I had that was dead uh, from euthanasia or whatever. Um, mm. I would um, open up the heart, and uh, there it was. And it was I found a lot of heartworm there, so we we started the the whole uh, um, uh, puppy relations exercise to inform people that it was a it was a real disease, and yes, yeah. it should be uh, should be uh, looked uh, seriously on. And even Red Dog had heartworm. There was a there's a great little story that'll be in one of my books about Red Dog because he wandered everywhere, so. He he was a classic to to get it because he, yeah. he all over the Pilbara, including some of the towns that that had pockets of it really badly. So I um I did a little heartworm test on him, and sure enough, he he had heartworm. So we we um, started his treatment, but the treatment in those days was uh was using a a, a, a tablet every every day of a um, antimitic. Uh, to and you had to be given every a tablet every day for for a month, but there was the problem because Red Dog was never yeah. once long enough. He never he never stayed with anyone for more than a day or two. So we hit on the idea of him being uh, looked after by the the Shire 
ranger who looked after the pound. Uh, so she locked Red Dog up in the in the pound so he could give his tablets. Uh, but then all the boys down the pub one evening heard that Red Dog was in the pound and decided this was a dreadful thing. So they they went out there in the middle of the night with bolt cutters and, and released him. So he didn't care, but it meant he wasn't getting his treatment. So when we finally caught him again, she had to um, lock him up in a paddy wagon and drive him around everywhere. So, mm. it was, uh, yeah, that was a... I think, I, think that, I think that when you mentioned your book, I think that you published one, and that's from the previous years, correct? About people yeah, yeah. the best dog? The, yeah, this is, this is okay. uh, book one, which is out at the moment. Okay. Um, with, uh, and that's me when I'm 12, 12 years of age um, with my first red dog, Pip. So this book is is basically my my years of uh, growing up as a little kid in Albany and and getting through that that first period of my life, my first era. Uh, the second book, which I've just written, uh, is all about my Queensland years. So anyone from Queensland and vet schools over there would uh, would really like that because it's, and any any new graduate, it's almost a manual for a undergraduate rather. Anyone who's at uni would uh, would like like that one. Uh, it's all about my trials and. And issues I had when I was at um, trying to get through through vet school, and then the third book is one for new graduates because that's when I was off on my first job in the in the Kimberley that I was talking about earlier, and then the fourth book is about almost a manual for starting your your first business because it's right. uh, it's, it's the Bilbury years and Red Dog, so yeah, it's been a lot of fun uh, writing these books and it's um, it's uh, sort of thing. But I, I like to do. I like to reinvent myself every few years, and and my latest reinvention is being being an author. And, yeah, yeah and, and as you said, there's uh, so much you can do with a back degree and expand wherever yeah. you want, basically. Yeah, so, yeah. And Absolutely. For me, um, I tend to go back to the diseases. I guess. Um, yeah. So you must have. Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, was this uh, Kimberley disease ever ever published, or was it? Um, I mean, I've I've seen it. I've seen I've seen the name at least. Yeah. Uh, and I imagine it's a hepatic encephalopathy of some sort. And yeah. did they get photosensitization as well with with the liver damage? And the did they get any for the for the sensitization or mm, not? The recall. Oh, okay. Yeah. More, yeah. Yeah. Was yeah. More yeah. The, 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 the new... You must have seen other sort of. Uh, Diseases that we may consider rare or exotic um, sure. over here, but I think Elikia made its uh, made its appearance uh, uh, recently um, over yeah. there, and uh, probably the transmission of venereal tumor, which is um, almost ahead of here, and it's quite prevalent, I think, in. Um, the northern part of Australia. I don't know if you if you've had it. Um, Not really. It was more. No. It was more the tuberculosis, and there was this yeah. campaign, the the famous BTEC campaign, uh, brucellosis and tuberculosis eradication campaign, and and we were to the in the forefront uh, it, with that all through the those, those years. I was first there in the in the seventies, continuing yeah. through the eighties. So it was uh, it was great to be on the ground doing doing all that stuff, but. But the whole thing about the, the Kimberley in those days, it was it really was like the Wild West and it was full of characters, full of uh, um, interesting situations. And it was just a fabulous place to go to as a, as a new graduate. And I guess that's my one of my bits of advice for new graduates is to go somewhere remote and exotic and, and have a go, take a risk and have a go. Mm. That's, uh, that's sort of been my mantra, I guess. And I've been very lucky that, uh, that it's worked out for me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So definitely unconventional, but definitely um, uh, veterinary for sure. <laughs> to its core, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it's it, it has so many aspects, and you 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 were there at the right time, I guess, and you expanded to the fullest. Um, so. Um, one of the things that is um, discussed or perhaps uh, seen a lot uh, these days, or perhaps more we're more aware of, um, is uh, burnout um, yeah. um, um, amongst veterinarians, particularly 
young of a journalist. Mm -hmm. And so um, I guess you were under, you were in a remote area uh, without any um, colleagues nearby, a uh, thousand miles. Um, I imagine the labs were far away as well. Uh, there was no internet. Um, uh, culturally, it must have been different, even though it was in the same state to what you were more familiar with. Um, and you worked long hours, drove, I imagine, thousands of miles. I mean, I just I'm just thinking, as you know, I'm not, I'm not a journalist. I'm just, I just want to chat, basically. Uh, what would be your thoughts on preventing or avoiding burnout amongst vets? That uh, you know, it, it's, 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 yeah. I'm glad you asked that question because I've, I've thought about it long and hard and wondered why am I so different? Why, why has it been good for me? Why have I been a happy vet for 50 years? In fact, I give it, I've given a talk, I do give a talk occasionally to people called the happiest veterinarian. And I narrowed it down to oh, a whole pile of what I call happiness values. And, and, and a lot of them are core values, such as truth and trust and, and all those things that make you tick. And, and but there's a lot of others, you know, such as exercise and variety and uh, delegation and all sorts of things. But and, and my way of coping, because it has been you know, it has been stressful times, but but I guess the 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 one word I use a lot of is um, you know reinventing myself. So if, if I got if I ever get a, a bit bored or a bit stressed or a bit unhappy with any aspect of what I'm doing, I'll I can branch out and do something else. And the latest one is the book. Uh, but before that, I've, I've gone out and we bought the a station and we've got the um, the aquarium in Shark Bay and and I've uh, looked at uh, having this uh, 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 group of vet practices and yeah, just trying different things. I've tried almost every aspect of vet, vet science, had a drug company, I've had a, had a, um, a recruitment business. Uh, when, I, when people want to, want to go to England, I, I set up Aussie locums to send people over there. And we bought a couple of practices in England and which, which is actually how Aussie locums happened because I had these two practices and and Back in England, then this is in the in the eighties uh, uh, and nineties, um, vets were hard to come by. So I thought, oh, okay, and I'll, I know what I'll do. I'll start a group in business, and I'll send vets to other vets in in England, but I'll keep the good ones for myself. So, so the Aussie Locum recruitment business was an offshoot of having the two practices in England, which which I've since sold. So, so I guess the answer is I've I've always reinvented myself, and I've developed my 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 happiness values. And one of the important happiness values that I advise anyone to try and do is to try and know yourself. And there's a great thing called the instinctive drive analysis where you can find out really what makes you tick, what you're instinctively like, how you instinctively act and react. And uh, once I, I know myself that it was so liberating to almost give myself permission to, to do what I wanted to do, and and a lot of that is uh, uh, is expansion and taking risks and having a go and feeling good about that. Whereas other people, and this is why there are, I think there is a lot of issues in the veterinary profession. A lot of people are probably in the wrong profession, and they beat themselves up if they can't get it right. Whereas if you have the disposition to uh, let it go, uh, not be perfect. Um, it, you can cope with it a lot, a lot easier. But I'm very happy to give my my um, happiest vet talk to any of the universities, and it's been pretty well received whenever I've given it. And you can actually apply it to any profession for that matter. Uh, and and if you develop your happiness values, you you work out what what makes you what makes you happy and concentrate on them. And so some advice for entrepreneurs: um, you've got to have your values right. If you haven't got values, Core values, um, ethical values. Don't even try. You know, don't even. You shouldn't be in business because people find you out straight away. You've got to be. You've got to have those core values of truth and trust and honesty, and um, and you'll be much happier and better for it.
Yeah, and people see through this, of course. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, and that's also, I guess, my 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 advice generally to universities, to the vet schools, and to the vet surgeons boards around the state, that around the country, that um, there's too much focus on perfection. Um, it's 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 okay to make a mistake. There's no such thing as mis mistake. You you don't have to you know get it right every time, especially in vet science, because it's pretty broad. If you if you are uh, that meticulous, uh, you shouldn't be in vet. You know, maybe going to dentistry or embroidery or something where which is sort of uh, um, you know very uh, pre precise. Uh, it's uh, vet vet science is and should be considered an imprecise science where perfection uh, is be aimed at, but don't get beaten up if you don't don't achieve perfection. Yeah, I understand that. Sorry uh, to say that to a, to a, to a, a lecturer, but uh, that's just my belief. No, no, it's, it's, uh, it's highly valued, and uh, that's why what, uh, we wanted to, to discuss these things. And um, I haven't discussed, uh, I haven't had a chat before with um, a vet with um, so many decades of experience and such a varied um, experience and uh, of course we, we vets generally follow different pathways but um, yeah. uh, I definitely wanted to hear your thoughts especially for, for our students um, and that there's lots of possibilities and uh, what your thoughts were after after 50 years of practicing and yeah. expanding into business yeah and it's just my, my just my belief and I'm, I'm not I'm not perfect by any means and and uh, as we both agree, there's it's such a, a varied uh, profession. You can do all sorts of things with a vet degree. I just happen to have done a whole group of things sort of my way, uh, and it's worked for me. And and I guess that's why my advice to uh, new graduates is to if they want to do like I've done, just yeah, take a risk, uh, it goes somewhere remote. Certainly, our our, our vet group, the pets and vets group, uh, we encourage people to to do that to. To go remote and and you'll learn so much and, and I've been told this by you know, quite a few others that uh, the, the nice little throwaway line if you come and work for pets and vets with our Rick Fenny's group you'll learn more in five years you look you basically get five years experience in one year uh, whereas if you had a city based cushy practice uh, you won't you won't learn anything near as much so my advice is to take a risk and uh, and go go bush, go remote, and and you know learn rather than just be taught. And again, it's, it's um, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but for new graduates, uh, often the worst advice they can get is from their lecturers to usually say, "Oh yeah, go and get a get a good mentor and go go where there's experienced people and surround yourself with uh, with that sort of experience." To me, that's the wrong advice. Um, you should do the opposite. Should go where there's uh, where you're on your own, and you've got to you've got to start using what you've been taught. You can you can you can pull it out. It's amazing what you what you remember when when you're under the pressure. But but if you um if you're working with people who are obviously highly experienced and you know really good teachers, but but there's a difference between being taught and uh, and learning, and that's I suppose that's the distinction I'm I'm, I'm trying to make. Yeah. And um, changing the subject a little bit, do you accept um, placements, perhaps probably from Murdoch or any other university? Or yeah, we'd love to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm just asking if you, if you, if you do, if you're doing this at the moment, or are you? Do you have any vet students from any agreement with any university? Uh, we we don't have very many, but we'd certainly yeah. like them. The very very. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. for many any of the vet schools, we'd love to see more of that. And myself and my general manager are always happy to visit the vet schools and uh, and uh, meet the students, meet the, the the lecturers, and and give a little talk, give our uh, give you give my happy vet uh, lecture, and a few other little ones that we've we uh, we we've got sort of uh, on PowerPoint, uh, often you know, little red dog talks and things like that. So. They all lead to the the same conclusion that uh, 
it's a wonderful profession and it's been very, very kind to me for many, many years. And, and writing the books has also been very liberating and, and there's so many hidden lessons in, in the books that I've only realised that when, once I've started to write that there's, I've learnt I've learnt so much by, by putting down the, uh, my thoughts and my memories of um, the last 50 years. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a great, you know, yeah, yeah. Well, you're certainly welcome uh, anytime you're in Melbourne to, I guess by that time we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be open to face-to-face. -face, um, we, we are at the moment anyway, but we, we, we're phrasing it in again. Uh, but you're certainly welcome anytime you're, you're in Melbourne. You. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to do that. Uh, so I guess, uh, I'm not sure what the time is, but um, I guess, um, yeah, we have some a few minutes for questions if uh, if anyone uh, anyone has uh, any questions for for Rick please just unmute yourself and and ask the question if you if you if you wish. The other thing I've got to say while, while we're waiting uh, is anyone who does go into practice uh, have got to realise that it's the, the, the client, you've got to listen to the client. The client comes first. The client doesn't want perfection. The client wants, just wants an answer and he wants to have a, a relationship with the vet and, and in, in life and in work, especially in practice, it's all about relationships with all about working with people understanding people finding out what they what they want finding out if you if you can help them and i have a oh i guess a great um world of people working with me directly uh and outside my own employee group uh i have a like a network of of supporting people uh who have helped me all the way along and I wouldn't get that if I didn't have the ability to uh, relate to people and talk to people and listen and develop those important uh, relationships. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm not sure we don't have our fantastic coordinator today, uh, um, but I, I can't see any any questions at the moment? I do have one. Um, I guess um, it's, a, it's a bit of a dry question, but um, from your from the vets that you that you're actually currently employing um, at the moment in within the group uh, of fifteen or so practices, I think. Uh, how many of them would be from? Uh, are they mainly, I imagine, Western Australians or Madoc graduates, or do you get? Oh, it's a, it's a real mixture. People? Yeah, there's a mixture. There's probably predominantly West Australian Madoc graduates, but we we have uh, uh, Queensland graduates. We have uh, 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 Sydney graduates, uh, uh, South Australian. Um, quite a, always a couple of overseas people. A little Irish came over here. We've still got, uh, up till recently, we had a couple of Irish people working for us. But yeah, they come from all over, and and they, they're certainly the successful ones are those that um, have followed my advice to to take a risk and have a go. And we we reward them by by making them part of the practice. Uh, we we have a lot of uh, people are working on a on a percentage of um, of the turnover, so that they are heavily invested in. In what they what they earn, they earn more relatively more than me out of out of what they what they do. So it's um yeah, we've got quite a few, uh, I guess unique employment initiatives that have made it work uh, very very well. But I do have a very good general manager uh, who I trust and delegate uh, to her. And yeah, a lot of it comes down to to trust in everything we do, and I I operate best that way. And it's I, like with like with every every, I guess human interaction, uh, trust is um, yeah, it's very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it seems to work anyway. Yeah, and uh, is your practice mainly uh, 
I guess, um, primarily uh, small animals or is it mixed? How much yeah, most, is it? Uh, most of them are, are mostly small animals, but in, in those uh, remote towns. But we do you know, horse work. We've got a couple of mixed practices in the southwest uh, where where we do uh, anything that comes through the door, a lot of uh, sheep and cattle and yeah, whatever. So, but predominantly, you have to say that uh, about 95, 90, 95 percent um, small animal across the board. Yeah. And I, I, did, did you just say camels? Did you say camels? No, no. Uh, <laughs> we do see that one. But uh, if you see Desert Vet, we've got some camels coming up in. Uh, in our new TV series, by the way, that's uh, series two is being shown uh, on Nine Gem as of uh, Sunday the twelfth. So okay. uh, we had series one, which went um, really did really really well on uh, Main Channel Nine a couple of years ago. But then they they sat on series two for a couple of years, and they've only just releasing it. So that'll be uh, that'll be a bit of an eye opener. And yeah, we got uh, some great footage of. This lady who walked her camels from Shark Bay to, uh, to Byron Bay. Oh, that's across the continent. Right yeah. across, yeah, right across. Yeah. She started at our, our station in, in Shark Bay and it went, went all the way. I think you have a practice at Shark Bay, if I remember. Is that correct? Oh, look, Shark Bay is a town of about six, seven hundred people. Oh. And uh, I go there once a month or thereabouts and do, do some of the simple stuff. Uh, I'm not into any doing anything much else at the moment, so yep. uh, I, I, you know, I can help them, help people out and refer them on or whatever. So I would just do you know vaccinations and consultations and things like that with a town town that size. There's not much vet work, but I do have uh, our aquarium there, the Ocean Park that my son runs, and we also have a, a sheep station that my other son runs. And I've got yeah, so three kids and seven grandkids all in Shark Bay, so I've got a good reason to go there. And then I go up north to Robin, up near Carafa for the winter because it's beautiful climbed up there in the winter. And I do the race round up there. Uh, there's about 11 race meetings. So mm -hmm. I do the official vet work for, for the, the, the race clubs up there. Yeah. Apart from that, I, um, I live in Perth and a bit of Albany and enjoy, enjoy life and enjoy writing these books. Yeah. Well, um, it's been fantastic uh, talking to you. And thanks again for accepting our invitation and um, spending this time. Um, uh, I think that um, th this was recorded and uh, we'll soon send you the, the link once it's it's available. Yep. And um, I just thank you again and um, your IT people as well um, for, for this. And um, again, you're welcome anytime you're, you're able to plan uh, a face-to-face -face, uh, face -face talk. Yeah, well, that should be in the the, uh, the first September and in, in uh, the first um, Saturday in September when the um, when the Fremantle Dockers are in the grand final. So I'll probably come over to to Melbourne then. Okay. We'll see about that. <laughs> yeah. All right, that that will be great. So My pleasure. Thanks again, very much. And, thanks, uh, guys. I'll just uh, you know, say goodbye. Thank you, and every, everyone's always Thank welcome to. Google us and give us a call. Myself, yeah. I'll always answer a call. So anyone wants to talk, send me an email or phone me up. I'm always very happy to talk to anyone, anywhere, about anything. Very yeah, I'm grateful for this. So this was definitely uh, a, a, a different style of uh, presentation that I think we uh, we need to have to uh, in in our in our series. So thanks again very much. Yeah, no, that's great. Thanks, uh, Panos and. I guess we we fell into it because of my conversations interview, and if anyone wants to listen to that, it's it's quite uh, I think it's quite entertaining. Uh, you go to the ABC podcast and look up uh, Rick Fenny Red Dog Vet, and it's uh, it was a great um, a great conversation with uh, Sarah Konoski oh, a couple of months ago. It was while I was in Queensland. Yeah, um, it will, we will, and um, okay, see so I, I think we'll, we'll leave it we'll leave it there. Excellent. Thanks again very much. Thank you. My pleasure. See ya. See ya.